Judges chapter 6, verse 25, and we're going to read 25 and 26, and then I'm going to look to do my best to bring out something that I believe the Lord has given me to share this morning. Amen. Judges 20, chapter 6, verse 25, the Bible reads like this. It says, Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has. And cut down the wooden image that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. Amen. Tell your neighbor, let's cut it down. Come on, tell somebody else, let's cut it down. And you can go ahead and take your seats this morning. Now, before I jump into a little bit more of of what I believe God's given me to share this morning, I do want to give just a little bit of context to this portion of Scripture. I'm not going to go into the entire story of Gideon, but if you aren't so familiar with him, um, he was a, a man who was, he felt like he was inferior, that he wasn't good enough. All right. I don't know if you've ever been there before, especially when the Lord comes calling and the Lord uh, gives you a fresh start. God saves us. He changes us. He cleans us up. But then all of a sudden, especially if you've been in our church, you know that you're called by God. Help me preach a little bit and tell the person next to you, you're called. Okay, I need you to tell them like you believe it. You know, speak some faith into them. Tell them you're called. There we go. I see some parents right now. You got your kid next to you. You can go ahead and tell them again, you're called. We're all called, and this man was called, Gideon was called by God, but he began to question, he began to doubt, and he even says in scriptures before the ones that we read that he was the least of his family, and his family is the least of all the tribes, and he felt very inferior, and he felt like he wasn't good enough, he wasn't adequate, and he couldn't do what God called him to do because of his situation, because of where he was at, because of his social or economic status, and all of these things, and began basically to make excuses, but God still called him, and eventually he Ask God to prove it, and God proved it. And God's not a man that can lie, and if he calls you, he calls you. And if you're called, you're called. The Bible says that the calling and the gifts of God are irrevocable, meaning that it cannot be taken away, that no man could ever take that, no person could ever say anything or do anything to us to take away the call of God upon our lives. One more time, tell the person next to you, you're called. Now, in this portion of scripture that we've come to in verses 25 and 26, this is where then the Lord, uh, Gideon built an altar and and he positioned himself to be able to receive from the Lord, which is very important. And then the Lord speaks to him and he gives him direction and he tells him what to do. And he tells him to tear down the altar of Baal. He tells him to cut down the, the wooden image that's beside it. And in this portion of scripture and in this time, and especially a lot throughout the Bible, you could see Baal referenced and even uh, in other names. But Baal back then uh, was a a particular God that was uh, worshipped by many, uh, many uh, different people, many different groups of people. It wasn't just limited to a certain religion or a, a certain group of people, but Baal was widespread as far as the worship of Baal. And this was everything against God. I'm summing this up to not go too deep into it for the sake of time this morning. But I want to bring out something very important today. And I believe that it's extreme important, extremely important for us to understand that Baal worship. And sometimes if you're like me, I can read scripture in the Bible or I can hear and sit under the word and I can hear things like this. But I could kind of make a disconnect from my life today. And I could say, okay, well, I don't ever hear Baal so much. I don't see uh, ads on, uh, on the side of the road that say uh, Baal or different things. But Baal was ultimately idol worship. Baal was, uh, there was a number of things that Baal included. And I want us to realize, and I, before I go into this a little bit, we have to have an understanding that Baal worship is still present today. That this isn't some story that is just way back when in the Bible that only Gideon faced and now we don't have to worry about it. No, no, no. Baal worship is very alive today. If anything, there is a rapidly growing culture of Baal worship once again. 
And what's important to take note of this scripture is that they also believed in the Lord. Hear me, church, that this, this, this time and in this day and age, it, God was God, but some places and some people, like we read about in Manasseh here where Gideon is from, they knew of God and probably also worshiped God, but they also worshiped Baal. Because how does Gideon know? And he hears from the Lord and he knows who the Lord is. He understands the things of God, but then right where he's at, and where he stays and who he's around and where his family lives, Jesus is and God is telling him to also take down the altar of Baal. That means that there was a somehow there began to be a mix at some point in time in this tribe and in many others. But we're going to focus on Gideon today where Baal began to be intertwined and they would worship God, but also worship idols. And you see it in multiple times and in, in different instances throughout the Bible. But that's also happening today. That we can know of God, but if we're not mindful and we're not uh, aware of what's happening, we could be worshiping God, but also have an altar of Baal right next to him. It's happening in churches. It's happening. You could see it happening online. You could see it because of social media and the, 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 the speed of the Internet nowadays. You, it's not hard to see that what I'm saying is true. I'm just trying to make a connection that the Bible is not outdated. The Bible is not some story that we just read about in history, but it's able to directly translate to our lives today. And it's important for us to understand that if God had to make Gideon aware that, no, 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 you can't continue and answer my call if Baal is still around where you are. Then I have to take it serious today, and this holds me accountable, and it should hold you accountable as men and women of God that say, okay, I got to make sure that I'm worshiping God and God alone. That I might love God with all my heart, I might understand, I might pray, I might do these things, but I also have to make sure that there's no other idols, there's no other altars around me. Baal worship is coming strong once again in our world today. In Bible times, Baal worship would include many detestable acts, uh, some, some real, real uh, just disgusting things. And a, a lot of it was, was widespread and became commonplace. Uh, one of the things uh, that was common and, and that is just absolutely crazy to think of now, but child sacrifices was normal. That Baal worship included children being sacrificed. And I'm here to maybe shed some light this morning that Baal worship is trying to attack our children today. That this whole movement and this agenda of non-binary and transgender and freedom of, uh, 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 of choice when it comes to gender and all of these things, they're not coming after uh, me and they're not coming after my wife, they're coming after my daughter. These things are, are going after our children. Did you know that that entire movement, they're trying to get into more and more schools? And even, I could probably pull it up somewhere on our YouTube page. And I think a few years ago, I said, it's starting in the States and it's coming strong. And there's a lot of court cases now. And you're hearing and seeing things for those of us that follow news on, on a global scale. And I said, one day it's going to start coming here and it's going to start hitting home. And just the other day, I read an article that somebody, uh, parents are suing a school because they, didn't, they misgendered their son or their daughter or whoever they chose to be that day. That's the type of things that come when Baal worship is present. Because Baal worship has always gone after the children. Baal worship has always included somehow being uh, 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 sacrificing children. And maybe back then it was, it was crazy and it's, it's wild to think that they would maybe kill children and even infants. And it might have been a certain way then, but today it might look a little different, but it's still going after children. And Baal worship includes the sacrifice of their life that belongs to God. Nowadays, they have young people that they're pushing and, 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 and trying to uh, get them to think that, no, 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 maybe you're not who God actually created you to be. Maybe you're not, maybe there was a mistake. Oh, how do you feel today? Don't worry about how God created you, worry about how you feel. 
And you know what they push for when they go for that? There's an agenda and even through certain practices and different things. And then that's where this whole movement of, uh, of becoming a, 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 of transgender and, and, and actually going under a surgical knife to change who God made you to be is becoming so widespread. Now, I know some of these things I'm speaking this morning might be a little hard to hear, but this is the reality of the life that we live in. And that's why I wanted to make clear that if I just read this scripture and, oh, okay, Baal, back in the day, Gideon, no, 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 it's happening today. Baal worship is uh, growing today in the world that we live in. And some other acts, uh, a lot of acts and a lot of things that inc were included in Baal worship had a lot to do with, 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 with sensuality and perversion. Now, I'm not going to go into any type of detail, but you can imagine the disgust of, disgusting acts and detestable things that they used to do. And sadly, we're seeing many of these forms of perversion come into our mainstream lives today. Where you look at media, you look at, you can't watch anything without there being some type of perverted, uh, sensual act, sexuality, something, even children shows. My God. There's so many things that have become twisted and perverted. And what it is, is that this form of Baal worship tries to normalize what once was demonized. To where now we're, we're, we're just okay. And they're trying to get everybody to just accept everything and just say, oh, it's okay. Instead of standing for what's right and saying, no, 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 stay away. Get that away from me. They'd rather just have you be okay with it. No, we need to just accept everything and accept everybody. But that's not what my Bible tells me to do. God created us a certain way and Baal worship will always try and pervert that way. There's a straight and narrow path. There's his perfect and pleasing will. Sacrifice might look different than back then, but it's still sacrificing the children of today so they don't become who God created them to be. And us as large, not just children alone, I know I'm hitting heavy on that because that's the future. And we all can play a part on that, whether it's with you have a personal child that you can uh, help with or not you're still an example you're still able to be an influence you're still able to model you're still able to pray you're still able to provide a covering that's why I love our church so much because no matter who it is we have teachers that are giving of themselves every Sunday to provide a covering for the children and together we pray for them together we're helping kids get to elevate we're making sure we do our part because we believe in the future that God has for them somebody say amen but we have to be aware of these things because the love and, and, and the level of, uh, of sexual perversion that's being promoted on every public platform and, and being pushed upon every single one of us, no matter where we look, is not by accident. Every single social platform known to man is increasing its reach today. Increasing its reach to every age group, increasing its reach to every ethnicity, increasing its reach to every person and every place everywhere on this planet. Even social media and the music industry at large is just pushing everybody again to accept everything. That means that it tries to remove conviction, tries to remove morals, tries to remove principle. That's why it's so much easier to just read and, and follow scripture and, and good sayings on social media instead of reading our Bibles. Oh, I'm guilty. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm right there with you. It's hard. You start scrolling and sometimes it's hard to stop. Somebody say amen. Oh, some of you are acting like, like it's okay. I might not know that you're there. I might not know that you're on your phone, but the Lord knows. The world today is trying to do the most to cancel the culture of faith in the church. Trying to cancel the culture of what God has done and what he wants to do. And this has been happening for some time now. And, and this is also uh, not something brand new, but I also want to bring it uh, to, to your attention just in case maybe there's some here who aren't uh, on social media a lot. Or maybe you're not uh, uh, as familiar with, with certain terminology. But the way the enemy is trying to do this and implement these things and how Baal worship once again is becoming so strong and growing. One of the main 
same tactics that the enemy has been using for some time now, for years now, but it's still very strong today, is the term cancel culture. Right, cancel culture, if you're not familiar with it, uh, kind of to sum it up in simpler terms, is just the practice of either rejecting, shunning, uh, stopping, or, or somehow dismissing somebody or something that you don't agree with. So those of us that know on social media, you see it a lot and you've been seeing it for some time. Cancel culture is if I don't agree with you, then I'm going to cancel you. And there's movements that take place and they happen real quick and they try and cancel this and cancel that. And you see celebrities and people who stand up for what's right and speak against the mainstream media. And all of a sudden you don't see them no more. That's that's cancel culture. And because of social media today and, and the access to everybody to see everything, it happens rapidly. So the enemy uses this, this, this tactic of cancel culture, and it's a real thing. It's not just a social media thing. Cancel culture is becoming a part of life, where even at school, some of your children face these type of tactics at school, where they begin to be canceled by a group of friends. They begin to be canceled by this and canceled by that. And some of us, even at work, you may have never heard it in this term, but the day that you said, no, I believe in God, and the day you shunned the, the, the sin and the lust and the filth of the world, all of a sudden, people stopped going around you all of a sudden your family stopped calling you so much all of those things that's not by accident that's because of what the devil's using in our world today to try and cancel God in your life cancel culture is a real is a real thing now but while the world is thriving and I'm not saying all this to give glory to the world in any way shape or form but while the world might be thriving in a movement of cancel culture we as the people of God need to focus on cultivating a culture of faith we can't get too caught up in what's happening in the world where we forget about what God needs us to get caught up in for his honor and his glory and that's cultivating a culture of faith and one of our greatest strengths in our ministry internationally is the culture of victory outreach if you didn't know, we have a victory outreach culture. And this culture breaks down racial barriers. This culture breaks down everything that comes between man, woman, and child. This culture started in 1967 in a small little lounge in East Los Angeles. And it was full of faith and full of power and anointing. And that culture of faith has led us to be where we're at today. We have a culture in our ministry and there's many things I can expound on when it comes to the culture of victory outreach that we love so much. But I think the main one that stands out to me the most is the culture of faith. It's allowed us to become the largest inner city ministry in the entire world. Ultimately, that culture of faith caused somebody to reach you and me. That culture of faith was cultivated in somebody's life that jumped on a plane and came halfway across the world and landed in the southernmost tip of Africa and said, you know what? There's a people that need God. There's families that need restoration. There's sons and daughters. They heard a mommy's cry. They heard a father's cry. They heard that Oma. They heard that Opa crying out and saying, God, will you save my grandson? God, will you save my granddaughter? God, will you help my family? And then all of a sudden, somebody full of faith and power said you know what I'm not going to worry about the culture of the world that says who am I to go all the way across seas to reach somebody that I don't even know you need to understand this this morning church it's the culture of faith that somebody believed in that somebody cultivated in their life enough to come all the way across the world to plant the flag of victory outreach to plant and raise up the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ and they said no one day you're going to need Jesus one day that son and that daughter is going to get saved one day that family's going to be restored. One day they're going to get their children back. They didn't see it. They didn't see our faces, but they had faith built inside of them. They had fought some good fights. They kept fighting the good fight of faith. And you and I are only here because of that culture of faith today. We are not here by accident. We're not here because the world just happened to move a certain way and bam, a church opened up. No, there was a culture of faith. 
that since 1967, in that small little lounge with a few people, there was a pastor and his wife by the name of Sonny and Julie Argonzoni, that when they couldn't see it in the natural, they had enough faith to see in the spiritual. They had enough faith to one day preach that we're going to be in countries all over the world, that one day people from other lang lands and foreign languages are going to be spoken in Victory Outreach churches. I don't know. Sometimes I think we get a little numb to where we're at today. I, I think sometimes we think this is just, oh, we're just blessed. Maybe it's just me and God's dealing with me. But maybe there's a few other uh, that are here today that sometimes we can forget the magnitude of what took place to get us here today. What took place to put us in our right mind. What took place so we could be saved and transformed. Some of us, our families have walked through these doors. There was nobody that would, well, they would, that would accept them. Nobody would accept your son. Nobody would accept your daughter. Nobody would accept you. I know you looked good. I know you thought you were all that. But nobody really wanted you. But because because of the culture of faith that was stirred up inside of a pastor, that was stirred up inside of a leader, that was stirred up inside of a missionary. Somebody said, no, 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 come this way and God could change your life. No, 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 come over here and watch God use you. The opportunity that we have is not by accident. It's because there was a culture of faith that was created. But that didn't just happen by accident. It happened because while there was maybe even a cancel culture happening since back then and now it's relevant today, Pastor Sonny, Sister Julie, our founders, our elders, the leaders that have gone before us, as you could see on the screen, if you could read it, it's not cancel culture any longer. In the culture of our ministry, in the culture of the kingdom of God, he's calling you and I to cancel the culture. It's you and I who are now going to cancel the culture of all of the wickedness and the darkness and the perversion around us. You and I have the responsibility, like those pastors and those leaders did, to cancel the culture of drug addiction, to cancel the culture of suicide, to cancel the culture of gangsterism, to cancel the culture of poverty. We're able to cancel that culture of the world. Because we have the power and the anointing of Jesus. It's alive and well within us. The world might be thriving through cancel culture. But you and I thrive by canceling the culture of the world. You and I are called to cancel that culture that tries to oppress us. That tries to get us to go back to the old ways. Cancel that culture. You can see so many things throughout the Bible where even Jesus himself would cancel the culture, where Jesus himself would do things that went against the crowd, that the men and the women that he chose to use, they weren't there being dictated by what the world was doing and what the world was saying and, and afraid of everything else because this world today will try and cancel the Christians and try and silence us and try and cancel everything that God wants to do in and through our life. But you and I have the opportunity today to not just realize what the world is doing, but to say, you know what, because of what God's called me to do, I can cancel that culture for my family. I can cancel those generational curses. I can cancel those things that have been holding us down. Tell your neighbor, cancel the culture. We need to cancel that culture of just wanting good vibes instead of wanting to gain true victory because that takes hard work. Oh, you ain't hearing me. Some of you, I didn't see your post, but I know you still post it. Just looking for good vibes. Some of you won't wear it to church, but you wear it when you go out, just, just here for the vibes. We need to cancel that culture of just looking for good vibes and learn how to gain true victory in our life. Put in some work to get something real. Vibes come and go. And some days they're good, some days they're bad. But victory in the Lord is always good and it always lasts and it never fails. And there's nothing greater than knowing that no matter what's going on around me, I can cancel the culture of that depression. I can cancel the culture of that sorrow. I can cancel the culture of whatever, God, whatever the devil's trying to do against what God wants for my life. And we can have victory in our life. That's the real vibe. 
victory on a personal level. We need to cancel the culture of I am greater than the I am. John 13, 6 reminds us that no servant is greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than the one who sent him. No matter how great we become in life, no matter how successful God ever allows us to be, we are never greater than the one who sent us. 1 John 3, 20 reminds us that God is greater than our own hearts and knows all things. He sees and knows all. He's always greater. Somebody say, God is greater. We need to cancel the culture of me being more important than we. Oh, Lord, help us. <laughs> this is a tough one for all of us. Everybody say amen. amen. Matthew 20, 28 reminds us that Jesus himself came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There's many more like you. There's many more like us that need to be served the gospel. They need to be served with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to cancel that culture of the slander and the bitter backbiting and the gossiping. And we need to cancel that culture. Now, don't start thinking of other people. I already, I can feel it right now. Tell your neighbor, don't worry about me. <laughs> you know what? You can read it later. I won't read the scripture. But in Psalms 15, verse 3, the Bible talks about those who refuse to gossip. Those who refuse to speak evil of friends. That's crazy that the Bible even references it in that type of way, that you would speak evil of friends. Hello. So don't get shocked when a friend says something, and you know, especially if they're not saved. It happens. But the Bible tells us that it's those who don't do those things. Those are the ones who may worship in the sanctuary of the Lord. Those who don't speak evil and slander and gossip about others, it's those who will enter his holy presence. We need to cancel the culture of my wants over what God wants for my life. Sometimes that's the biggest struggle. It's just I want, I want, I want. My daughter's in that phase right now, right? She's two years old. Terrific twos. I'm speaking by faith still, almost a year later. And she's in that phase of I want, I want. You're like, no, how do you ask? Like, okay, please, daddy. You know, I want, I want, I want. Sometimes we're still like that. Oh, okay, it's getting quiet now. Let me move on to the next one. Not nobody here. Maybe in another church. Maybe some people, even though we're grown adults, we still, I want this. I want that. God, I want this. God, I want that. God, I want this. God, I want that. We got to cancel that culture of my wants over what God wants for my life. Matthew 6, reminds us if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then... All these things shall be added unto you. Some of us, we flip that scripture and we think, okay, God, once you add it, then I'll seek your kingdom. Oh, God, once you add all these things unto me, then I'll give more to you. Then I'll participate and run for hope. Then I'll, okay, let me move on. Let me move on. We need to cancel the culture of my thoughts over God thoughts, God's thoughts. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Uh, I, I, I've always loved this scripture in Isaiah 55 verse 8. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. I always remind myself of that. Every time I don't understand something, every time I'm a little bit unsure of something, every time I know I'm trusting God, but it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel good trusting him. Anybody ever been there before? Right? You got faith, but it doesn't feel like strength, right? You feel weaker. You feel less assured. You feel like you're walking on eggshell. You feel just like, oh, man, what's going on here? I remind myself it's okay because God's thoughts are not my thoughts. I don't have to understand it all. As long as I continue to have that faith in him and I cultivate a culture of faith in my life and I stand on his word, every time I'm unsure, I can say it's okay because my ways aren't your ways, so I'm not meant to understand anyways. We got to cancel that culture of Christians nowadays being afraid of being canceled. Cancel the culture of Christians being afraid to just speak the name of Jesus. See, look, if you've ever felt like that, and I have too, I, and I've worked in, in different places around different people, and sometimes that fear will try and hit you. At school, when I was at university, sometimes I would like, man, I'm, I, you know, am I gonna, what are they going to say? How are they going to look at me? Am I going to be shunned? Am I going to be the outcast now? 
But we have to cancel that culture that the world is trying to create where Christians are afraid of speaking the name of Jesus. And you know what I did one time uh, when I was in university? Uh, I felt it so strong and I was like, man, nah, I know who I am in Christ. I know God's called me. I know I'm a mighty man of valor. I know all the things that are being spoken over my life. I know what God's word says about me because I've been reading. I've been praying. I know God's called me by name. He knows every hair on my head. I know who I am. And we had an event and I took a whole stack of flyers and I was walking around and I had a stack up against my chest and I didn't leave my campus until all those flyers were gone. Because it was me canceling the culture of worrying about what others thought. It was me canceling the culture of being ashamed to be a Christian in my campus. Mark 8.38 reminds us, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man, will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. Let's not be ashamed. Let's not be ashamed. Cancel that culture of being afraid and ashamed. And I know it's not, uh, nobody wants to take that on. So yeah, I'm afraid sometimes. I'm ashamed sometimes. But that's what cancel culture of the world will try and do. And try and keep us quiet and silence us. We got to cancel that culture of rebelling against the word of God. Somebody say amen. amen. You know what the Bible says about rebellion? Some of you, some of you know. Some of you, <laughs> you can read it later in uh, 1 Samuel 15. Uh, at verse 23, it's, it's, uh, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. We got to stop rebelling against the word of God. I'm just, I'll, I'll stop right there. Some of you are like, whoa, hey, go read your word. Got to find out what God's word says. We don't want to be practicing witchcraft. Somebody say amen. amen. We need to cancel the culture of approving that which is unapproved by God. I've shared previously Romans and, and different scriptures about the uh, 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 unabased mind and where literally sometimes we can find approval of things that God's word disapproves. And that's something we have to be very careful of today. And how do we do that? How do we counter that? We have to make sure we know what God does approve. Tell the person next to you, you got to read his word. Come on, tell them, read his word. The musicians can make their way. You know what? I want to I wanna make sure I, I, I mention this one. And I'm going to ask you to really hear me because I know this can be a, a, a touchy subject nowadays. But we need to cancel the culture of accepting anxiety and depression. Now hear me because, yes, God also allows doctors, medicine. I used to work. Let me, let me give a little context on where I come from with this as well. I used to work with, with uh, uh, like middle schoolers, like our, our, our new gen um, in, the, in public school systems and high schoolers as well. And I know very well that some medical things, different things, there's imbalances, whatever it may be. And we had to make sure that they took their medicine and there's a place for that. There, there's, there's good cause for those things. And some, it really does help in a tremendous way. But when there's knowledge of God's power and when there's an ability to pray, and there's faith. See, this is why I was saying it so strong earlier of, of cultivating that culture of faith. Our ministry is only where it's at today because of faith. So when faith begins to get in the mix, all of a sudden we don't just accept those things for what they are. And today the cancel culture of the world is really trying to cancel the power of God. Trying to cancel the anointing of God trying to cancel his life-changing power, trying to cancel the ability that faith is allowing God to do the impossible. So nowadays, you see more and more in churches of an acceptance that anxiety and depression is just a real thing. It's always been real. Just now, it's commonplace. Just now, it's more accepted. Maybe it's not looked at as bad as it used to be, like a mental disorder or anything like that. But nowadays, it's trying to be accepted so much that you even see Christians forgetting that there's a God who can change, that there's a God who saves, that there's a God who delivers, there's a God who restores, there's a God who gives you your sound mind. And instead of standing on God's word and believing by faith, that anxiety and depression does not belong in a child of the Most High King, you see nowadays they're just being an acceptance and a lot of help that comes and that help does good, but it doesn't change. 
all of those things may be good, but they don't bring change, genuine change. And look, this isn't just my thoughts. I look at God's word and I stand on it and I believe it. If God said it, that settles it. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, be anxious for nothing. I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning, but I could feel the power of God. And you've been in here and you've been struggling with anxiety, struggling with depression. Don't hear my words. Hear the word of God. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That sounds like a beautiful life to live. To be anxious for nothing. To not let anxiety weigh us down. To not just accept it because that's what the world says but to stand on God's word and say, no, 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 I'm anxious for nothing, but I have to pray. I have to make my requests known to God. Social media isn't a source of change. Your family's great, your friends are great, people are great, but they're not our source for change. God's word says, be anxious for nothing. And then it goes on to say that if you do these things, then the peace of God. Oh, this is where it gets so good. If you've ever struggled with depression or anxiety, hear the word of God this morning. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. There it is again. You don't have to understand it. It doesn't always have to make sense. It takes faith in God to be anxious for nothing, to pray, to make our requests known. And then that peace that surpasses all understanding doesn't just come and go. It says that it guards our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. We need to cancel that culture of accepting what the world says is normal. I want you to stand with me this morning. You know, there's tons of scriptures in the Bible that I could continue to reference of of canceling the culture. And I even think of Jesus himself when, what did he do when he went into the temple and he saw things that weren't right? What did Jesus do? He started flipping tables. Jesus was a G like that. I don't know if you've ever pictured him like that. I do, maybe it's just my mind. But I picture Jesus and I picture him flipping tables, like getting kind of gangster on people. Not that you should be gangster, don't don't get it twisted. God's delivering us, right? But Jesus was flipping tables, and you know what? Today, because of the world and because of culture and doing it for the vibe, some of us need to stop sitting at tables that Jesus would have flipped. Some of us really have to start looking around and say, am I sitting at a table that Jesus would have came in and flipped? If Jesus were to show up in that room, if he were to show up around you in that group of friends, if he were to show up around that family gathering and you're sitting at that table, would he sit with you or would he flip that table? We gotta cancel the culture of normalizing what's not of God in our life. And it might not even be you, I'll end with this. It might not even be you necessarily, but it's what we're around, and it's not, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's by default. Gideon was called. He positioned himself. He made an altar so God could speak to him. God speaks to him, but what does God tell him to do? He tells him to get busy right where he's at. What does all this look like? What does is, what, is, what, is what I'm sharing actually look like? If I could sum it up and relate the Bible to our present day one more time today. It means we got to tear down those altars of Baal ourselves. You might not be worshiping at it all the time. You might not, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know everybody's life, everybody's situation. When you go home, wherever you go throughout the week, but it's probably around. Gideon was hearing from the Lord. Think of this. He was hearing from God. And yet right outside his door, I don't know how far, I'm just... Forgive me if you're a theologian. I'm not trying to be biblically incorrect. But it's right there. It's his family. His own father had an altar of Baal. So here's a man that's receiving from the Lord, goes outside and sees an altar of Baal. 
But what does Jesus say? He says, no, 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 don't just keep going like you know you're called and okay, it's you and Jesus. No, 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 go tear that thing down. So how do you and I cancel the culture of the world in our life? How do we cancel the culture of the world for our family, for our co-workers, for those around us, for our community, for our city, for our nation, for our country? How do we do that? We gotta tear down those altars. We gotta cancel the culture of Baal and any idol worship, any perversion, anything that tries to exalt itself against God. Bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning. Father, I pray right now that your presence and your spirit that's here this morning would begin to do a deeper work inside of every one of our lives. Father, I know your word has gone forth. I could feel you here. I could feel you moving in our lives. I could feel you challenging and convicting. I could feel you giving freedom of depression, freedom of anxiety, because we're able to cancel that culture of the world. We're able to cultivate a culture of faith. And Lord, I pray right now that you would begin to come in your power, in your might, and you would cultivate yourself inside of us this morning. Lord, I know you're already moving. I know you have been having your way, but I ask you to move in a greater way in our life. You know, church, I'm not going to do a traditional altar call this morning. I believe the Lord's, I, I, and, and I could feel whoever it was, anxiety, depression, I know, and sometimes maybe we look forward to coming to the altar, and I'm not trying to rob you of that, but I do feel that this at large is gonna benefit all of us. I know personally there's things, this was challenging my life and I pray it challenges yours to cancel the culture of the world and we no longer normalize sin and all these things because of what the world is trying to push. And we get back to God's word to cancel the culture of the world. But you know what's so powerful about this and why it's worked so well on an international scale across continents is because the culture that we have in our church, the culture of victory outreach that I briefly mentioned in the beginning. I, sometimes I still just take a step back and I look at what God's done through our ministry. I take a step back and I look at what I'm able to be a part of. I look around the room and there's nothing but miracles around me. I said, man, God's powerful. And it all started because there was just a young couple not even a church as large as this, but a young couple that decided to cancel the culture of the world and what it was saying in people's lives and started to just give faith, faith, faith. So here's how I would love for us to close out this morning is I would love, if you don't mind, if you're okay with it, I would love for you to just reach out across where you're at, even just whoever's around you and just put your hand on somebody's shoulder. If you're with family, you can grab their hand, whatever you're okay with doing. But I would love for us to close out in a, in a strong, just a minute or two of prayer. Because God's word, it's, it's gonna continue to minister. I believe that this word God gave me is for all of us. Like I said, it's not just I'm something I'm telling you. No, 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 this is dealing with me. But if we all together in one mind, one accord. And there's a, there's a new sense of oneness in our church. If you haven't noticed, you haven't sensed it, there's something different taking place. And I believe this is gonna add on to that where we're gonna all together cancel that culture to where it's not me versus you, you versus they, they versus them. No, 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 it's us canceling the culture of the world. Not just in our church, it's never gonna have victory in our church, but maybe in our personal life. Maybe with our family, maybe you're that one that's hearing from the Lord, but there's things when you step outside of your door, whatever it may be, we're stronger together. And I'm gonna ask you to just close your eyes, bow your head, and however the Lord leads in this moment, you could feel free to just begin to pray for your neighbor to your left, to your right. And if you don't know what to pray, I'm gonna ask you to just say, Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. 
Lord, give us the strength, give us the courage to take a stand for what is right, to cancel the culture of these things in our lives, to cancel the culture of the world that's trying to oppress, that's trying to keep us down, that's trying to silence our voice. And Father, ultimately, we want to see you glorified. We want to see you magnified. We want to see you highly lifted up. And Father, we no longer want the culture of the world to dictate who we are and what we do and what we say, but we want that culture of faith to be cultivated within our lives like never before. Hello everybody, this is Pastor Dre. We hope this message has been a blessing to you and encourages you to grow in your walk with the Lord. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to give to Victory Outreach Church of Cape Town, there's a link in the description. You can go ahead and click that link and it will take you directly to our giving page. I want to encourage you also to follow us on our social media platforms. You can also stop by our website to get more messages at www.vocapetown.net. God bless you.